Hello, yes, I'm Chris Jefferson. So tonight you've heard, you have heard and you will hear people who do lots of very interesting research. Um, I have dedicated the last 10 years of my life to solving Sudoku. I was doing Sudoku long before it was cool. <laughs> and since it has stopped being cool once again. But there was that little period of about a month when I was kind of cool. Of course, I don't actually sit every morning and solve all the Sudokus in the paper. That would be silly. I write computer programs which themselves solve Sudoku. Um, now, there is a problem, which is it doesn't seem like a naturally funny subject. And you'd be right. I spoke to some of my Sudoku-solving colleagues. We have a yearly conference where we meet up and talk about the latest breakthroughs in solving Sudoku. It was in Spain this year. It was very nice. I got food poisoning, though. But it was generally nice. And I said, is there any jokes about Sudoku? And it turns out there is one joke about Sudoku, which is on March the 13th in California, there was a newspaper which published a Sudoku, which had two sevens in the top row. <laughs> but that is the only joke about Sudoku. And so it would be a very short act if I stopped at this point. So I said, OK, but I've made computers solve Sudoku, and they do it better than people, it turns out. So I'm sure I can get a computer to make jokes better than people as well. I'm sure the skills are transferable. So I went to lit the tools we literally use to solve real Sudokus. And so one of them is genetic algorithms. And they work very much like you might expect. We take two sort of things. For example, like we could take the DNA of Michelle Pfeiffer and the DNA of Stephen Hawking's. And we mix them together, and if we're very lucky, we end up with a genius sign supermodel. If we're unlucky, Stephen still had a really pleasant evening, and he's a nice guy, good scientist, I think he deserves it. So I did this with jokes. I took the software we use to solve Sudokus, I fed it lots of jokes, and I said, come up with some new jokes, see what you come up with. And these are some of the examples of the better jokes that you came up with. An Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman walk into a bar, a stick. <laughs> How many women does it take to change a light bulb? Death by Moo Moo. <laughs> um, and the best thing about this is I can apply the genetic algorithms again. You can keep applying them. You can keep breeding your jokes. So I could do an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman walking to a bar. Death by Moo Moo. And so you get a huge sample of jokes from doing this. But they were still a bit repetitive. They, there wasn't the variety I would like. So I looked at another thing we use. We use this thing called Markov chains. And I'm not going to explain to you what it is. Um, but it has been used. People have used this to solve Sudoku. People have used this to write academic papers. They've had loads of academic papers in. A new academic paper came out. And it got accepted to conferences. Not very good conferences. <laughs> but I feel if it's good enough for bad, probably fake conferences, it's good enough for bad, fake comedians like myself. So I fed it lots of knock-knock jokes. And this is literally, once again, this is what came out of my, my program. It came out with knock-knock, knock, knock-knock-knock, knock, knock-knock-knock-knock, knock. Now, it, once again, it started well, it had a weak ending. Now, those of you who are programmers will hopefully appreciate this. I mean, it wasn't, on one hand, it was very bad. On the other hand, it came up with like 8 million jokes a second. <laughs> so I didn't want to just write it off. <laughs> Put a lot of work into this. I could have been spending writing comedy. So I thought, I'm going to hammer on through. So I thought, right. No, no, because obviously what you do at this point is you do what you always do with computers. You just randomly hack it till it works. So I said, no, no, not knock jokes look like, not knock who's there, X, X, who, Y. So I set it up again, started feeding all the knock-knock jokes into it again, and it, off it was going, and it came up to knock-knock, who's there? The interrupting cow. <laughs> the interrupting crash, blue screen, everything goes. <laughs> at this point, it's last night, and I've got some fairly weak comedy at this point. Um, so at this point, I do what I always do in highly stressful situations when I have an important deadline, which is I just went and played computer games instead. I have been a long, I, when I was young, I really enjoyed playing computer games. I do now write computer games. It's great fun. Um, when I was young, I used to play computer games mostly because I didn't understand girls. I know that's a terrible stereotype of computer scientists. I am unfortunately really stereotypical. 
an event in my life that I remember which didn't help me was when I was young, um, a girl was once flirting with me. It did happen on at least one occasion. And I just entirely didn't notice. And one of my friends did notice and said, you see, your problem is you kind of, you weren't motivated to notice. I thought I was quite motivated to notice when girls fancied me. So he said, so he physically beat me and said, now you'll remember and you'll notice when girls are flirting with you. <laughs> what happened was now when girls flirt with me, I just kind of twitch nervously, and that puts most girls off. The one saving grace is I've met one woman who is willing to not, isn't worried about flirting, is just willing to say, I want to date you, I want to have sex with you, and it's fabulous. For the men in the audience, I'm afraid to tell you that she is now my wife, so you can't have her. You will, in fact, see her later on. She is here, and that didn't seem to insult her too much. Now, my wife isn't perfect. She is almost perfect. Unfortunately, she had, she wasted her childhood. She spent her childhood going outside, playing netball for Scotland, not being indoors playing computer games. So now she's not very good, but I do enjoy playing them with her. So I feel I have to let her win sometimes. It turns out that there's a great skill to losing convincingly, because you can't just stop. Because that's obvious. So what you have to do is you have to wait and say, oh, she's fired a shell at me. It has completely missed. But if I swerve straight across four lanes of traffic, I'll hit the thing she's fired at me, and she'll think that she's won. Now, as I, you can see a computer game theme here. I often go to events, I go to pubs, and I say to my friends, why don't computer games get taken seriously as art nowadays? I think they should get taken seriously, like books, like films, television. And then I go home, and then I remember why computer games don't get taken seriously as that. There are some computer games which are great. Um, Harry Potter is a glorious adventure for children. This, all people enjoy reading Harry Potter. Um, many of you, I'm sure, here have played Mario, which I would say is similar. It is a glorious adventure designed for children, enjoyable by all ages. Sometimes you want to read War and Peace. Some people may want to read War and Peace. Certainly I don't personally, but... But in computer games, when they try to make computer games adult, what they basically just do is they take Mario, they make it all brown and grey, and Mario says, fuck a lot, and Princess Peach gets her tits out, <laughs> and they say that's an adult computer game. <laughs> it's not really there. The other big problem, so I've recently been playing a game called Super Meat Boy, which some of you may have heard of. Someone has heard of Super Meat Boy. That is awesome. It is great, but it is very difficult. And I'm unfortunately starting to get old and a bit slower. And I emailed the people who made it, and I said, I love your game, I've got about a quarter of the way through, and I'm stuck, can you give me a hand? And they said, no, it would be unfair to the other people to let you skip through the game. You have to earn the game. And I said, no, no, no. You see, I earned the game because I gave you 20 pounds, <laughs> which I earned in my job. <laughs> this is my social life. <laughs> other things don't do this. You don't get films. You don't watch, people don't go to watch Transformers, and then just before the big scene at the end where some Transformer attacks someone, I don't really follow Transformers, <laughs> they don't say, no, no, in this film, in the background, there were 20 birds. Now you got to know where all those 20 birds were, or you don't get to watch the end of the film. And if you missed it, you have to go back to the stat. <laughs> Books don't get steadily harder to read as you go through. And they say, at the end of each chapter, if you didn't understand any of those words, no looking in a dictionary, <laughs> you have, you're not allowed to read any more book. Now, there's a real irritation this causes in me, which is when I was 12, I had both the skill and the time to complete computer games, but didn't have the money to buy any. So to me, there is an obvious solution to my dilemma. I just pay a small child <laughs> to come to my house and play computer games. <laughs> I'm happy, I get to see the rest of the computer game. They get free money in computer games, what else does a small child want? Everybody is happy, apart from the parents, it turns out, <laughs> who get really upset when I go to the playground. <laughs> so I have decided there is only one answer to this. There is a way of getting children which you are then allowed to basically do whatever you like with, you just have to have your own children to play your computer games for you. And I think that's what I'll have to do. Thank you.